Good morning, everyone. Hello, it is 10 o'clock. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Welcome to the Friday SLO Talk. My name is Yale Kiano, and I'm the founder of the Friday SLO Talks. I have the pleasure to be joined by Enrique Hauriki, uh, a representative of the Coaches Group, California Assessment Coordinators Hub, a group we have created a couple of years ago. And Enrique is going to help me uh, moderate the discussion this morning, unless other coaches show up in the, in the meantime. Uh, Enrique, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Enrique Jauregui. I'm the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College. Uh, we're located in the Central Valley of California. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we begin, I just would like to remind everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. Please post any questions that you may have for our guest. And if you wish to speak during the presentation, please don't hesitate to raise your hand, contact uh, Enrique or myself to articulate your question for you if you prefer to do it that way. We are also going to post a Padlet momentarily in the background. So if you wish to um, post more questions, suggest answers, please don't hesitate to, to do so. Uh, finally, we are expecting a large number of attendees today, so let's see what happens. But those who are coming in late will have to be watching a live event on the on the outside. Uh, our guest today is uh, Dr. Luke Hobson, a senior instructional designer and program manager at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, XPRO, a lecturer in the Department of Teaching and Learning at the University of Miami and the founder of Instructional Design Institute. He's also the author of the book, What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer, and the host of the Dr. Luke Hobson podcast, and he also uh, manages his uh, own YouTube channel. Welcome, Dr. Hobson. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. Absolutely, Yark. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. If it's okay with you, let me start doing this, sharing my screen, going into here. And folks, let me ask the very cliche thing. Can everyone see my screen okay and also hear me as well? Give me a thumbs up if yes. Awesome. Seeing some few thumbs up. Fantastic, fantastic. Pope Garrick, once again, thank you so much for having me. And folks, thank you for being here. And welcome on in to the nerdiest workshop you are going to be a part of today. Today, we are talking about designing online courses beyond the discussion boards. And this topic is very near and dear to my heart because for many people, when they think about online learning, they think about discussion boards. Now, what I find to be so interesting is that back in 2010, I went for a master's degree that was completely all online. And the structure of my course basically went something like this. Every single week, there was a reading, followed by a discussion board post. I had to post my initial post by Thursday at basically midnight. I then had to respond to two of my fellow peers by Sunday. And then I had to submit a paper. That was the structure of every single week. Repeat that for 10 times and then repeat that for 16 times for the amount of courses that I took. And then all of a sudden, I had a master's degree. Now, did I learn something? Yes. Could the learning experiences have been designed better to go above and beyond? Absolutely. To me, when we think about teaching, when we think about designing online courses and programs and trainings and workshops and whatever it is, we can do so much more. Now, when everything actually happened with everything pertaining to the pandemic and the lockdown happened, all of a sudden, we began to see conversations talking about remote learning and emergency learning. And unfortunately, those go mixed into the conversations about online learning, which, as you know, that's really not the same thing. A true type of an online course has time. You prepare. You think and craft everything as far as for taking the latest and greatest pertaining to best instructional practices, research, learning sciences, and regaji, and then mixing that all together. Remote learning, emergency learning you're in a crisis. It's not the same thing. So of course, we can do so much more. And especially in 2023, and I keep on seeing conversations talking about essentially a battle about what is better face to face versus online learning, there doesn't need to be a competition. But when done correctly, 
online learning can be extremely powerful if we do everything right. And the thing that I would say to all of you, the 81 of us who are currently on this call, is that I promise what would have happened is that if I was basically to take three of you, let's say three instructional designers, I gave you a topic, I promise you would design a learning experience differently than other people. Not to say that that's right or that that's wrong. The same thing too, if we're taking to with instructors as far as if you were to teach a certain type of a topic, and then I gave you the learning outcomes, and then I said, teach this for 16 weeks, you would teach things in different ways. Because of the fact, the beauty of learning experiences is that to me, it's when we take learning science and everything that we know from research, but then also putting in our own spin, our own own unique perspective. It's that artistic, that innovative, that creative style that really makes things come alive. And that is what we're going to be talking about and sharing and practicing today. Because my goal for all of you over the next couple of hours or so is that I want for when you go back into your own learning experiences, whether you are teaching or designing, that once your students and learners fill out those evaluation forms at the end of everything, you're going to be getting glowing reviews and five out of five would love to take this course again because it was different. It's not that traditional tried and true way. It is going to be something that is going to wow people. I want them to tag you on LinkedIn and your university and saying, this is the greatest class I have ever taken. Why can't more classes be like this? That's the goal. That's what I want for literally all of you inside of this call. And that is what we are going to be going through. Now, how are we actually going to do this? Here is my agenda for us today is that I want to be able, oh, it looks like my slide is stuck. Is that true? I just saw that quickly. You do not see anything. Yorick, do you see my slides? We are, we are seeing agenda right now. Perfect. Perfect. May, it might be some confusion because I didn't move through any slides yet. That was just me talking. I talk a lot. Hence when Yarek was like, you have two it's hours. I'm like, oh, that's very dangerous. We cannot do that. So can you see my agenda slide? Yes, we can. It's the AI behind you that's doing all the work. The AI behind me that's doing all the I'm work. I'm sure there is something behind you who is doing this. Oh, yes. As you know, we won't be talking about AI. <laughs> There's today. just no explanation for there it. There is no explanation is to not. anything evolved. No. All right. So let's go it's back so to the, let's go back to the agenda here. So this is what it's actually going to be is that for today, we are going to be covering briefly talking about backward design. This is a type of an instructional design model that we can use, whether for teaching or designing learning experiences. We're going to be talking about different ways of thinking about learning assessments and learning strategies. That's what's going to make your learning experiences so unique. And then talking about learning activities and content to surround everything and put that learning experience all together. And then we're also going to be talking about research and analyzing everything because it's not just enough to try things and then to put it out there. We need feedback. We need to be able to incorporate student and learner voice and to make sure what we are doing, we can constantly produce and make better every single time because there is no such thing as a perfect course. We always need to keep on thinking about next steps. And then the last but not least is then talking about trying to be able to implement everything. And of course, I'm going to be putting you inside of breakout rooms so you are not just going to listen to me babble on for the next two hours. And we're going to also have a Q&A section at the end of everything. So that is what I have for you so far. Folks, go into the chat for me real quick. Backward design. Have you heard about backward design before? Just give me a yes or give me a no inside of the chat. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. I'm seeing some no's as well and fantastic. And whether you know about this from before or not, it is okay. All prior experiences are welcome inside of here. I did some quick homework before coming into this and I looked at all of the past presentations so far from uh, these, <laughs> these Friday sessions. And the thing that I saw was definitely talking about with Bloom's taxonomy, lots of talking about learning outcomes, learning objectives, which is wonderful because basically that is the first part of backward design. So I am not going to hammer that one home. I want to focus more on the other sides of this and how these all kind of come together. But if you have not heard about backward design before, the short and sweet about it is that this can be divided up into three different types of separate stages. The first is thinking about what type 
of problem are you really solving of training and with education? What are the actual goals? What do you want people to be able to do by the end of everything? What are going to be our results? And when thinking about it from an academic perspective, that is when we're talking about learning outcomes, learning objectives, learning units, things of that nature, different terminology for different institutions, but we are thinking about those things. Then once we actually have those in mind, we take a step backwards, hence the name, and this is when we need to be able to think about the evidence. How do we know that people are on track? What are they doing to prove that yes, they do understand something, or maybe we need to be able to think about things and provide other different types of additional ways of support. So this is pertaining to developing assessments and exercises and things of that nature. And then last but not least, Least, we take one more step back. And then that is when we're thinking about accompanying everything together, thinking about the learning activities and the content and surrounding that entire learning experience. That is essentially backward design in a nutshell. And I'll be sharing with you a little bit more along the way. I also have kind of a different perspective about backward design, because as Yorick mentioned, I am both an instructor teaching in a doctoral program about learning sciences, but also I am an instructional designer. So I see things in a little bit of a mix combination of the two, which hopefully I know a lot of you have different types of backgrounds who are joining us today, that you can find some and all of these different types of conversations and different forms of topics to be helpful. So once again, folks, go into the chat for me real quick. I am super curious. When you have your course, how many of you do types of meet and greets and kickoff calls when your courses begin? Give me a yes or give me a no. I'm always curious about this one. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. That is fantastic. I've done this presentation quite a bit. And there usually are quite a few more no's. Now, of course, you might have your own style and your own flavor of how you like to be able to do these things. Before, I did not do these things. I had the type of a traditional sense of going into online courses where essentially people would come on in and it would be much more asynchronous in nature. So we didn't do this. But then I started to actually teach this course that was called Instructional Design Principles for Course Creation. That's over at EduFlow Academy. And we started to do these types of meet and greets. And essentially, I'm calling them speed networking is really what we did. Now, the purpose of these is that what we were trying to be able to figure out, and which we did actually see for the results of this, is that if we were to actually try to be able to have people come together from the very beginning, it creates stronger bonds, more opportunities opportunities, more conversation, more feedback, especially we're talking about peer reviewed based feedback, where we want folks to be able to work with one another and share that candid type of feedback. Well, definitely, it's reducing barriers and awkwardness when we did this. And of course, it helped for people to be able to learn more about one another to be able to then have those organic conversations inside of a discussion boards or inside of a different types of live workshops. And it really did help everyone to actually click. How I did this very relatively and straightforward is that we would do this essentially of having questions prepared ahead of time, placing people into breakout rooms for five minutes a piece, come back into the main room just to make sure that everything was still working, and then repeat, repeat, repeat until eventually everyone had a chance or an opportunity to be able to meet one another. We've even did this too for some group sizes that were huge, 250 students, 500 students, and it still worked every time to be able to do this, which was absolutely insane. And we did it through Zoom. You can, of course, you can use it through Google Meet Teams, whatever platform your institution uses, that's absolutely fine. Now, one of the things though, that I learned about very quickly from speaking with students and getting feedback is I found that for many people, they still wanted to have the interactions of actually being on camera, but they themselves did not want to be on on camera, which I thought was kind of interesting. Mm. So I took a lesson from something that is called a VTuber. Now, if you have no idea what a VTuber is, go and ask someone within Gen Z and they will quickly tell you, I had no idea what this was until doing some, some talking with some people. Essentially, a VTuber, it's a personal type of a virtual YouTuber. It is someone who does indeed make videos on YouTube, but they did not want to actually be on camera. So they found a way to have a virtual representation of themselves like an avatar to go on camera. I was like, well, that's interesting. Could I give that option to students? Because I know that not everyone is going to be in a type of a place and time to be able to share their background, but they want to still be able to have those different types of having eye contact, facial recognition, and things of that nature. So tried it out. I found a different types of ways to be able to make this work. And amazingly enough, 
it really did do a phenomenal job. You're seeing a couple of different types of examples over here on the screen. One of them being Ready Player Me, where I created my own version. That's what I am on the left-hand side. So I have a virtual representation of myself, but there are many more. Uh, Face Rig is another one. And there's a whole bunch of different types of options ranging from free to actually paid. And you can pick and choose whatever one works for you. But this is going to be something like actually having a realistic version of you, a cutesy animal character, an anime character, or whatever. There are all these different ways about being able to do so. And this became more inclusive because now anyone can join into this conversation with using these different types of platforms and having these different forms of conversations, which was so interesting to think about this, of being able to have people go about with doing all of these things. So that is how I kick off my learning experiences to try to make them a little bit different. But now I want to go back and talk more about from that backward design perspective, we were thinking about different forms of acceptable levels of evidence of knowing why and how people are actually progressing. So this is my type of hypothetical question for you is what is the purpose of assessments? Kind of an obvious question. I'm talking to 97 educators here. But the thing is, is that what I have found from designing so many online courses and programs over the years is that for many people, they instinctively think, oh, an assessment has to be at the end of this week. And it's like, well, why? What exactly are, do we really want them to be able to do? Because I do not just randomly see a purpose and throwing a quiz at the end of every single week. I could be more purposeful with making sure that they actually know about why I am asking them to be able to do something. And that's one of the main principles of andragogy is thinking about with these different types of adult learners and adult students. One of the things that they ask about is what's in it for me? Why am I doing this? And it's, you know, today we don't just give someone a command and expect them to do that. It's not really how it works. We want to be able to tell them a little bit more about the purpose behind the design and what they're actually going to be able to learn about. Now, this should be aligning back to those learning objectives, back to those goals that we did initially set. So if you are being asked to do an assessment, you should be able to see how the process is going to help you to eventually hit that end goal. And that is always something that as an educator, I'm trying to be able to remind myself about if I am putting a type of an assessment, an exercise, a something within a learning experience, there better be a right reason why. Now on the screen right now, you are seeing a slew of different types of assessments and learning strategies. And I'm sure that for some of these, they're going to sound very familiar to you. And maybe some don't. And this is only just a snapshot, a fraction of them. There are so many more when thinking about scenario-based learning, project-based learning, gamification, simulation, team-based learning, narratives, case studies, and much more. We can add all of these different types of flavors and elements into the learning design to really make something pop out and to really make something be different different beyond just including discussion boards inside of what is it that we do. Now, one of the things I love to be able to use is something that is called scenario-based learning. Go into the chat for me real quick. How many of you have used scenario-based learning before? Give me a yes or give me a no. Seen a lot of yeses, seeing some no's as well. Well, no problem at all. So there's different forms of scenario-based learning, I will say that. And I use my own kind of style about how I learned about scenario-based learning back when I was working at Northeastern University. But if any of you follow Christy Tucker online, she does what is called essentially branching scenarios inside of an e-learning perspective of having one scenario and depending upon your actions, then branches into another, into another, into another, until finally there is some form of a final destination. When I think about scenario based learning, I am thinking about taking my current students and putting them into some type of a hypothetical situation, a challenging issue, something where they have to imagine themselves and then figure out how would they solve this? What would they do? What, what would be the actual next steps in all of this? Now, I use scenario-based learning in pretty much any type of course you can think of, but one of my favorite examples, because it had such insane results to be able to see where the conversation went from during the course with things, is that I was designing a course right before the pandemic that was all about innovation. And inside of this course, it was talking about different forms of business models. Really, how do people make money based around their own types of products and services? And I was doing some research at the time and I was looking around and I realized that other countries were going into lockdown where over here in the States, we currently weren't. And I was like, hmm, that, that could be troublesome. If there are no live events, 
how do people make money who are artists, mu musicians? W w there's no live events. What is it that they do? And I started to think more about this. And I was like, well, what would something like a company like Coca-Cola, where they heavily rely on their live events to generate the most amount of their profits, what would they do? What kind of new business model will they venture into to be able to still try to be able to make way? So I created that scenario and I posed it to the students as far as we're saying, you know, congrats, you work in the research development lab at Coca-Cola. This is going to be happening. What would you actually do? What form of business model would you take? And this was right before everything actually happened. So they started to talk more about it. And they're like, well, I would do something like a membership or a subscription-based model. I would partner with Instacart or DoorDash or GitHub or something like that. And we would figure it out. Then in real time, the lockdown started to happen. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh, companies are actually doing now what we just talked about. Like, yeah, now this is real. Now we're going to actually see how the scenario plays out in real life. And it was an amazing conversation to be able to see what people said. And then two weeks later, starting to see some organizations experiment with different types of business models and trying to be able to figure this out. Now, the other thing too, if you're looking at the top of the slide, is that I mentioned about how it's scenario-based learning, but also I then wanted to be able to use peer-reviewed based feedback. Now, thinking about this, if you have not done peer-reviewed based activities before, essentially, this is when your students are, is kind of doing what the name says, is that they are giving feedback to one another. And there's different types of ways of being able to do this. The type of learning platform that I use had essentially a ticketing system where when somebody submits an assignment, it would then give two other assignments. And that's how the students were giving feedback to one another. What I quickly learned about after the very first course and making many mistakes, which you're going to hear from a lot from me from everything, I made many mistakes, which is how I learned about how to do these things correctly, is that I didn't teach people about how to give feedback in a proper way. So there was no conversation around constructive feedback or trying to be able to uh, give more reliable, helpful type of information for feedback. And that's when I was like, hmm, okay, now going forwards. I'm going to have a section in the courses to be able to teach people about how to give that feedback. And then, then when they're actually going through within the learning platform and then actually talking about perhaps improvements, what they did great about, what um, they could do as far as for differently the next time around, things of that nature, the feedback is going to be much more helpful and it's going to be more reliable because now they know about how this really does all work. Now, the results of peer-reviewed based feedback and activities and things of this nature, it really is astonishing. What I was able to find and, and see with my own, uh, my own eyes here is that students want the feedback from others, but they also value that feedback from their fellow peers just as much, sometimes even more than the instructor. And that's because of the fact is that this feedback from them, it is relatable. The people who are giving them feedback are only one step ahead of them, one step behind them, or they're actually on the same level playing field. So because of that, that feedback was relatable. Combining that with instructor feedback really did give a much sense of a bigger picture with everything. It also was really interesting putting the students inside of a driver's seat to be able to see like, oh, this is how you use a rubric. And oh, this is what my instructors go through as they're giving feedback. It's like, yeah, it's not that easy, is it? I want to make sure that you're experiencing the same type of thing too. And because of that, it was fascinating. The most interesting case study I can actually share with you about this was a really unexpected thing of combining scenario-based learning and talking more about peer-reviewed based feedback is that in another course, it was talking all about, it was an engineering course talking about manufacturing. And inside of there, it gave a type of a hypothetical situation. And one of the students mentioned about how their organization was going through a really similar problem right now. They don't have the tools. They don't know how to figure it out, but they're actually trying to be able to figure this out literally in real time. He happened to respond to another student who they found out from conversations afterwards that they worked at the same company and they had no idea they were both enrolled in the same class. One of them was dealing with this type of a situation over in a Washington plant. One was dealing with the situation over in a uh, North Carolina plant. And they began to realize like, wait a second, 
we're both going through these same problems at the same organization. And it showed about how the organization was so siloed, much like how many organizations are also siloed. But they then began to have a conversation around this within the types of live workshops. And even in the discussion board, the conversation branched over into there because then the entire class was trying to figure out how to help them to solve this problem together. And all of that connectivism, all of that type of connectivity came from having this type of scenario-based activity and the peer-reviewed base feedback. Another thing that I love, when done correctly, which is the biggest thing because this is one of those buzzwords that many people see and they're like, uh, when done correctly, simulations are fantastic. So once again, go into the chat. Tell me, have you used simulations before inside of your designs? Give me a yes or give me a no. Oh, there's a lot more no's in this one. That's interesting. That's interesting. So I cannot fault anyone who says no, because I have dabbled and experimented with some simulations that were, yeah, they were not that great. And it was all basically building around the hype and the buzz around simulations and gamification. Other times I have used some simulations that are incredible. And this is one of the ones I wanted to be able to share with you from designing a leadership program. We used a simulation that was called the change management simulation. That's over at Harvard business publishing. You can Google it and you can find it. I would encourage you to do so. If you have a leadership program, it's outstanding. What this simulation does is that it has a scenario on the back end. You can pick and choose to being able to decide about where the students should be in this type of a hierarchy of an organization. And the main goal at the end of a simulation is that they should be able to lead a change initiative within their organization. Now, if you want them to be able to lead with a seat of power, for instance, being like the, you know, the CTO of the company or a CEO, you can do so. If you want them to be able to work from the ground up, perhaps these are entry-level people and they're starting from the bottom and trying to figure this out, you can also adapt and modify that as well. And what the simulation really asks them to be able to do is to figure out how are we really going to lead this change initiative throughout the organization? What steps are you going to take? What action items are you going to do? Are you going to host a mentorship program? Are you going to walk the walk? Are you going to host a town hall? Are you going to send out an email? What are you going to do to generate buzz and to get people on your side and to be able to move up this different type of hierarchy? Now, just like within the real world, if you do perhaps get on someone's bad side, that's going to happen. And that person is not going to be that keen on listening to your ideas. On the flip side, if somebody loves you and thinks your idea is incredible, they're then going to tell their next closest peer or their supervisor, and it's going to spread within the organization. And it was so fascinating. Many of the students who were taking this basically described it as playing some type of a leadership uh, Sims game is, is kind of how they said. And what I noticed on the back end, because of course you can see all the analytics and we were seeing that students were playing it sometimes five times in a row, 10 times in a row, and maybe more. We only asked them to play it once, but what they thought was so interesting is that it began to show them about why some of the tactics they use in the real world didn't work because it gave them the research at the end of everything to say, here is what this was based off of, which was actually based off of Harvard's publishing about this different type of research. And then it became a competition. Then people were trying to be able to go into the uh, discussions and then once again into the, the online classes and talk more about, well, I was able to do everything within this period of time versus this period of time. And it became so interesting to see about how people were actually using this and to go through with everything from this entire type of a process. The next is talking about project-based learning. I'm going to assume, yeah, I'll just ask you anyway, how many of you use project-based learning? I'm going to assume many of you have used project-based learning before, but I am actually making an assumption. And yes, Matthew, to your question, um, they do fail. Uh, inside of there. It's entirely possible that you are not able to be successful and you have to replay it again, which is actually very interesting. Seeing a lot of yeses inside of the chat, that does not surprise me in any way, shape, or form. Project-based learning is used throughout higher education. It always has, always will be. And it does make sense to be able to use PBL as well. This is thinking about having a type of final project in mind, dividing up the entire project into different smaller forms of milestones, being able to do those submissions, collect feedback, 
revise that type of assignment based around that feedback and then try again. And usually for a traditional type of an online classroom, usually around three to four submissions. One example that I can give to you that I've had pretty good success with that, it was with a type of a web design course. So the end goal of this was that the students are going to be creating their first and uh, their own type of original type of a website. So week one, talking about wireframing. Week two, the color scheme and the branding, putting that all together, making that prototype, and then being able to submit get feedback. Then from there, creating the structure, the homepage, doing it again, the about us page, the checkout page, the contact us page, keep on going again and again and again. until so eventually at the end of eight weeks, the entire website that was fully functioning, launched and good to go. This is also extremely helpful too, because inside of the real world, especially for web design, for those who are going to be either freelance artists or for those who are working at an organization, it is never that you just go and build a website without any form of insight or feedback or having to go back and forth. And for the real world, usually it's extremely frustrating working with a client because they have their own list of demands and you are doing a lot of people's skills and negotiating and influencing and trying to be able to get their buy-in in order to really show about what the website could look like because of course, some things are possible and not possible within the real world. So that gave those types of students the real life perspective about how this really works before diving on into things. The other one that I love to be able to use is talking about with case studies, especially for case studies with looking at this, which essentially are real world complex problems that we can use to connect the real world into the classroom. That is by far the thing that I always hear from students the most is that they want more real world examples. Many of the different types of topics that we do teach about, it's, it's theoretical, it's abstract, and they want to have some form of a concrete example to put around that. And of course, this then backs up and shows the importance about what you are teaching about how you can take the theory, where it comes into the real world. And now that epiphany, that aha moment of, oh, okay, I get it. That's really how all of this makes sense. One of them that was an extremely interesting case study that we used for a leadership program was talking about the rise and fall of Nokia. I'm just going to assume right now that none of you have a Nokia phone. Yeah, safe to say. Yeah, it's, it's because none of us have a Nokia phone anymore. Now it's just all Android and iPhone. And it's extremely interesting because, of course, it wasn't that long ago that all of us had Nokia phones. And if some of you say, you do, it's in your drawer. Yeah, not shocking at all <laughs> to hear about that. But there was an entire case study that was published around what exactly happened within Nokia. And for a leadership perspective, a business perspective, it is fascinating to hear about the documentation of really what was the rise and the fall of Nokia, which ended up essentially being the C-suite level of people not wanting to be able to hear the feedback from the boots on the ground, the engineers who were fearing that everything from this type of an operating system was essentially held together by gum and duct tape and band-aids. And they were saying it's not going to work, but that feedback never made it up because they were afraid of delivering bad news. Therefore, they did not deliver the bad news. And all of a sudden, everything fell apart. An interesting, interesting case study, even if you were not in the business or the leadership world to be able to read about this. But when we did bring about this case study into the classroom, it clicked and people understood about the importance of feedback, communication, empathy, flexibility, it all actually came together, which was so interesting to see. The other one, and I'm curious to see what the reaction of all of you is going to be, how many of you do role-playing activities inside of your courses? Once again, give me a yes or give me a no about those. Uh, this one's a little bit more mixed. We got a bit of yes and a bit of no as well. My first no. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. So this is what I find to be so interesting is that, and I wish that as a student, I had more role-playing activities when I was going to college because I didn't realize about how many types of conversations I would have that were going to be high stakes conversations that having some form of practice or guide or some prior levels of knowledge beforehand would be so valuable 
able to do. I mean, just yesterday, I was negotiating a contract around a different type of uh, price and longevity around how long we're going to be using this type of a vendor. It's now a part of my normal day to actually have these conversations and for thinking about where we can do more of these different forms of role-playing activities around topics. Think about it from sales, entrepreneurship, leadership, even just human skills with resolving conflict, trying to solve a problem, project management, anything like that. Now, the thing that I found that was always so tricky about role-playing activities is that essentially you have three different ways about how to actually go about with doing this because, of course, you need a script. You need people to, to follow something. Yes, they can just practice. You can give them a topic and hope that they wing it. But having a script, especially for the first time, is definitely going to be helpful for them to follow. So how can you actually go about with doing this? Well, the first is that you can make it yourself. Not impossible to do definitely takes a considerable amount of time. The second is that you can buy a script. There are definitely plenty of websites that sell those and, and follow along those guidelines. But then the third option, which I found to be very interesting, is that we can use Chat GPT to make us a script. Now, whatever side of the fence you are on about AI, because new things are constantly coming out every single second within AI, there seems to really be three different types of camps pertaining to AI. Those who have fully embraced it, those who really don't like it, the fear about plagiarism and all of that stuff, and those who are kind of in the middle, optimistic, but can still see about the negativity and kind of thinking about this. At least for the role-playing activity part, this I am all aboard on 100%. So inside of chat GPT and what you're looking at inside of the, the screen is that I made a very long video about 15 different ways that I've been able to see and use chat GPT as an instructor and as an instructional designer. So if you want to go and find that video on YouTube afterwards, it'll explain to you as much as humanly as detailed as possible how I've been able to use this. But this was one of the things I talked about where essentially I said, create for me a role-playing activity for two students trying to negotiate a sponsorship deal. And it did. It came up with a type of interesting script talking about for student uh, athletes trying to be able to have their, I think it was their uh, ultimate Frisbee team get a sponsorship, which is super interesting. And of course, it goes way farther down, way more than I can share with you inside of a screenshot. But it gave what student A should be saying and what student no, B I should be saying. And it was super interesting to see how that all came together. So by all means, that is certainly one thing that you can use for ChatGPT to be able to try it out, especially for all of you who have never used role-playing activities before, to see what this could really look like. Because, of course, once again, ChatGPT and anything AI-related, it is a Kickstarter. That is the whole point, is that you should be able to take it, and then it needs that added human touch. It is never, ever, ever going to be perfect. But for trying to be able to do this activity, it can get pretty close for the first time. So... I'd recommend giving that a shot if you haven't yet already. And what you probably are able to figure out by now, folks, is that I like to be able to mix and match, to use different types of learning strategies, combining scenario-based learning, peer-reviewed based learning, thinking about a case study and a presentation, or anything else of the sort, because you can do that. Once again, what you do for designing learning experiences, it is indeed taking science and art and mixing them together. There is no right or wrong answer for being able to say that you want to be able to take a capstone and then put that together with a different type of a role-playing activity and someone to say, no, you can't do that. Those rules don't exist. By all means, try things out, different people, different audiences, different types of audiences and uh, formats and deliveries and modalities. Really interesting about what you can do just from the learning strategies perspective. And then now I have talked way too much. So now I would love to be able to put you inside of breakout groups to be able to start working on some of these things together. So what is this going to look like? I want you to imagine that you are working in the professional development division of your university and you are creating a leadership course based around decision-making and critical thinking. The background for you is a target audience for first-time managers, 25 to 35 years old. It's a three-week-long course. It's a blended learning model, and you can actually go and think about it more from that perspective. 
take these two learning objectives that we have, which is exploring the ethical implications of decision-making in leadership and also developing strategies to mitigate cognitive biases and emotional influence that can impact decision-making processes. And think about what assessment would you do? What would you create that would align to those kind of learning objectives that would then serve that target audience? Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this information. I'm going to put it in the chat for you because I know, and by all means, actually, I should say this. If you want to take a screenshot of this real quick, feel free to do so. <laughs> Folks, would anyone like to share what they've talked about as far as for their assessment ideas? Please feel free to raise your hand emoji, whatever, and go right ahead. And of course, you can always put things as Alpa just did inside of a chat. If you are more comfortable of putting your answers in the chat, please feel free to do so. And if no one wants to talk, that's okay. Because once again, as just discussed, I can talk. I'm I can talk. Please go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in our group, we talked about, because it's a three week course. So we figured the way I wrote it in chat, that's kind of how we would break it down. Week yeah. one would just be content where we identify cognitive biases and explain what it is and, and so forth. And then week two, we can use case studies to see cognitive biases in practice or in real life situations. And then week three to role play to assess for a transfer of whether that was uh, content was learned. Mm, I like it. Yeah, I like it. You can definitely do that. And trying to be able to do that mix and match and that stack as well could definitely be fruitful. So awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Cool. Well, folks, while we keep on rocking and rolling here, I want to make sure that I am respectful of your time. So let us keep on going and making sure I'm in the right section, which I am fantastic. Okay. So we just talked about learning assessments. We already talked about the uh, outcomes and objectives. And then finally is talking about everything with wrapping it all around with thinking about designing everything else for the learning experience. When I say the learning experience, I'm thinking about learning activities that are usually ungraded as well as content, which is much more exploratory in nature. Now, for many of these things on the screen right now, you have probably seen these before. Obviously, discussion boards is one of the notable ones here, but also talking about multiple choice, matching, drag and drop, things of that nature. But I want to expand upon a few of these, talk a little bit more about them because perhaps they're not used as much within the online course space. And I really think that they should be used more. So go into the chat for me once again. How many of you use polls inside of your online courses? Give me a yes or give me a no. All caps, yes. That's what popped up right away from seeing that. Yeses and noes as well. So polls are interesting because I was at first not convinced that polls were something that my adult students really wanted. And one of my colleagues, and she convinced me, she's like, you got to at least try it. I promise you, adults love to vote and see results. I, okay, if you say so. So what we actually ended up doing is that for one of the videos, this is a uh, course that was all about networking. And within the course, the professor then says in one of these videos, he asks, who is the better network of this type of hypothetical scenario, Bob or Jim? And as you can see, Bob has a whole bunch of different types of branches to all these different types of locations where Jim is much more uh, centralized and focused within the United States. So at the end of that video, he actually asked, Asked the question in the video, who is the better network, Bob or Jim? And then that poll, that drop down would then appear. And then students can either vote upon yes, they think it's Bob or no, they think that it's Jim. What was interesting about this is that the students who were taking this course saw their own network within the character's network and saying, well, my network looks way more like Bob's. I'm voting for Bob as opposed to Jim. And that's what actually been led to a more organic conversation afterwards about how this really all does come into play. 
Now, following that poll and that video, I incorporated something that was essentially called a practice question, because as educators, we would like our students to practice and to fail inside of a space space like an online classroom. I want you to fail in my class before you go out into the real world and try something and perhaps it's not going to go so well and there are going to be some repercussions. So one of the things that I asked the students to be able to think about pertaining to their network was think about a topic that was called a structural hole. And what a structural hole basically is, is when you can see that you have two networks and they are not connected, there is a missing link, there is a gap. How can you fill that? How can you actually become the bridge to connect those networks together, thereby actually increasing your power at your organization? So I asked them to be able to do so and describe the steps that they would take. For practicing this, they just simply wrote about it. For some of them, they put pen to paper. They did a bit of a mapping activity to actually go and see where the real hole was within their network that helped them to visualize things. But overall, it allowed them a sense of practice because not every single thing needs to be graded and evaluated. If I want you just to go and to actually write out your network and to be able to figure out where you can become that missing link, I don't need a grade for that. I, I just want you to actually go and to practice what you just heard about from that video and make sure that everything does connect. The other thing I like to be able to include at the end of every single section, module, however you use your terminology, is that I incorporate something called reflection questions. And reflection questions sound exactly like what you probably think. I want people to stop, pause, think, and reflect upon what they just went through. What were their main takeaways? What could they take from this information and apply it into a past experience or thinking about it from a futuristic standpoint, what could you take and apply into a future experience to make sure that something doesn't happen again, or it happens better the next time around, or how to capitalize it, or something along those lines? What I have found for many of my adult learners is that they do not have the right type of mindset when going through an online course, because usually it's, I want to hit the next week. I want to keep on going. I want to keep on doing the thing, which I appreciate. I'm glad they want to keep on persisting, but also at the same time, it's like they need someone to say, Hey, you're stopping here before you go any further, reflect upon everything. Let that information sink in before you just move on to the next thing, because that's not how learning works. You need to be able to give that some time to make those connections and then to be able to use that. Yes, metacognition, exactly, exactly. Trying to be able to have that inside of there, that is what's going to really make that difference. And I put those at the end of every single module just in case. Now, those are some of the learning activities. Now let's think about learning content, because as I mentioned from my 2010 degree, everything I did was a reading. I bought textbooks online all the time. That's different in 2023. We have many different options, especially if in the online space, podcasts, articles, ebooks, audio files, videos, webinars, and many other different things. Now, podcasting it's very interesting when I started to dabble with this. Actually, go into the chat for me once more. How many of you use podcasts inside of your course? Give me a yes or give me a no. This one usually gets more no's than as, as I'm seeing many no's. So and for those of you who say yes, bravo, because podcasting is not caught on yet within the higher education space for sure. So that is interesting. Here is how I discovered just starting to use podcasts inside of courses is that I was assigned to teach a course within a graduate program. I was put into the course. I was the main learning instructor. And then going through that course, I had everything was already developed. The, the university essentially made it for me. I was just there to then lead the conversations, the grading, the feedback, the discussions, the so on and so forth. It's like, got it. I went into the discussion board. I asked everybody to go in to introduce themselves and to tell me why they are here. What are they interested to learn about? Why are they taking the course? And then I find out to my horror that most of them wanted to learn about something that was not in the course. I was like, oh, that's not good. I'm like, how do I handle this? It was a course about marketing and everything for the content of the perspective was coming from the angle that you were gonna be working at an organization. You're gonna be working at a marketing team. Half of my students were entrepreneurs. And they're like, I came to learn how to market my own products and services. It's like, oh, that's not good. I'm like, okay, how am I going to do this? I turned to podcasts. I was thinking about it. A lot of the content, it was there. 
It just needed that missing piece to be able to help and to supplement that information to show the other perspective of an entrepreneur. So what I decided to do was that I went through all of the topics of the course. I then took those keywords. I searched for different types of marketing entrepreneurial podcasts, and I was able to go and to match them up and then to assign a podcast at the beginning of every single week and to make sure that that relevant information was indeed in place. So if we we're going to be talking about building a type of a Google AdWords campaign or SEO or whatever it was, I found a podcast that matched that. And what I heard from many students was that that was the thing that actually did connect everything and made all that type of a stars align and everything was good to go for moving forwards. After that, I was like, all right, I'm going to use podcasts inside of my courses. And these were some of them that uh, we use talking about from Seth Godin, Pat Flynn, two of the marketing entrepreneurial gurus out there. Of course, I listened to all the podcasts myself to make sure that they were appropriate. They all had the transcripts, everything complied as far as where that went. And that is essentially how I plug those into all of the courses. The other thing that I then started to experiment with that was not uh, something that came to me initially, but eventually I got to there is that for all of my courses, I do pilot programs. I try to be able to get this information in front of potential students and learners first, learn from what they experience, add in all of those changes, and then put that into the next version that is then going to be coming out. And I keep on doing that again and again until I get it right. Well, one of the things that I ask about inside of the courses is that I asked, how long did it take you? And what I heard from a bunch of them was that for one of these courses is that it, they wanted more. It was there, but they wanted a bit more. And I was like, okay, so do you want more videos? No. You want more readings? No. More activities? No. I was like, okay, what, what, do, I, what do I do then? What, what exactly do you want? I kept on getting this, this type of wall of everyone telling me no. And then finally, I was doing a focus group of students and I said, okay, tell me, where do you have time? to be able to dedicate to studying without the things that I just talked about. And what I heard from them is that they're like, well, I have a commute. If you can give me something during my commute, I would listen. I'm like, okay. So if I hypothetically made a podcast episode that matched up with the course's topic, would you listen? And to my surprise, people said yes. And I was just like, no, there's, there's no way on earth that this is actually going to be a, a whatever. I, I didn't believe them, but yes, indeed, Enrique asking about this, it did. It did match up and essentially it became an additional type of an optional resource to be able to make sure that everything did align. So what I did was that I went and I was able to find content that there was too much content in the course. It didn't make the final cut. There were interviews from industry experts talking about the topic for that week. And then I came in essentially as the narrator. I wrote a script. I was weaving the story together with mentioning about a certain course topic and then having the industry expert then go and say way more intelligent things than I did about the topic. And I kept on doing it like that. Eventually, it became a podcast series for MIT for leadership, which still shocks me of how many people have actually downloaded and listened to it. But the feedback that I then actually saw from students is that they were posting in a discussion board asking about when's the next episode going to come out. Evan, that's when I had to break the bad news is saying like, sorry, folks, I'm not making more. It was only supposed to be for the three courses. Here you go. Here's your three podcast episodes. But it really did resonate with these adult students because adults, for me, my, my target audience, as you can tell, is, is adult learners. They use podcasts. It's, it's used by millions of adults. So, of course, why wouldn't I give them a podcast for their learning experience? So, hence... For going forwards, I start incorporating podcasts, whether from the industry perspective or whether from making it myself, if I have the time, energy, budget, resources, and putting it all together to make a really interesting and unique learning experience, especially for on the go. Now, as we're currently doing a type of a webinar, obviously there are webinars and discussions within our online learning experiences, but I found to use some very interesting different types of platforms as well too. So once again, go into the chat. Have any of you use either of these platforms you're seeing on the screen? One's GatherTown and one is called Spot. Have any of you seen those before? 
And Alpa, yes, to answer your question, I did use, I did curate the podcasts, but I also did make them as well. I did both. I did both for that experience. There's a lot of no's as I'm currently seeing coming in. And this is interesting. So back in 2019, before everything happened with the pandemic, I was invited to go to a conference at MIT and the conference was held on something called GatherTown. Now I logged into GatherTown and I had no idea what this thing was and it instantly told me to make an avatar. So I did. Having to drop me into a virtual world where I then got to go and walk around and then see poster sessions and listen to the keynote speaker and all of these things. But the most interesting thing about Gather Town, which is also it's the one of the left hand side, by the way, I probably should have said that first. What was interesting about this entire Gather Town experience, though, was that it was based around proximity. So the closer I got to a person, the louder the audio became. And then once I was done having that conversation, I could back up my little virtual character. And then all of a sudden, that person's little Zoom window at the top would begin to fade away. Now, it was different. It was something I've never experienced before. I also quickly experienced that if you're going into a type of a conference atmosphere where there's 50 people meeting in the lobby, Pretty crazy. <laughs> Instant chaos begin to happen. But once you were actually to able to go and to move into a private room or to be able to be in a type of a one on one situation, it became much, much more manageable as well, too. And yes, in space is another one that there's, there's all these different types of ones that are popping up nowadays, too. So for this, it's kind of like if Super Mario and Zoom kind of combined together to make this. Uh, it's free up to 25 people, at least at the time of this recording, it's free. And I was able to go in to take this and I started to use this for my own courses. I would host and what you're currently seeing on the screen, I would host fireside chats with my students. So we would gather around this virtual fireplace, if you will. And then I would put them into breakout rooms, much like what we just did on Zoom, but the breakout rooms are the furniture. So I would then tell people to go and pick their own virtual breakout room. So to give them that autonomy and that flexibility to pick and choose who they wanted to work with, and then they can go into pick and choose. And then that's what made that private conversation. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed for being able to go and experiment with that. And it's uh, gather.town if you want to go and search that. The other one on the right-hand side is called Spot. Now, Spot, what makes this one interesting is that this does both a first-person view and a third-person view if you want to be able to do so. And this is how we used to host office hours for students. So what you're seeing is that I was listening to music in the background, had my little virtual desk and chair and plant thing there, and my students would walk in through those glass doors, and that's how I would host office hours. Same thing. It was always so interesting. And it always began a conversation started like an immediate icebreaker from people being like, what is this? And I was like, I know it's, it's different. This is an interesting way about being able to do things. But my team at work started to host meetings in this way. And we would go into this type of different collaborative space. And the one thing that I loved about Spot, which I have yet to see in any other platform, and maybe now this has changed because this was, this was a little while ago, was that Anyone could share their screen at any time. So multiple screen sharing capabilities where you could stack them, embed them, place them however you wanted. And that was really, really cool to be able to do so. So those are two different ways to be able to really break that ice and to go through things. I'm fairly confident that Spot is also free as well. So if you want to try it out for yourself, give it a shot with your team, with your class, whoever it is, really interesting. Obviously, know your target audience, which is one of the biggest things I hear from some people where they're like, I can't work with professor so-and-so, they would hate this. And I'm like, understand, then don't do it with professor so-and-so. Know your target audience, know when it's appropriate to be able to bring this into the picture and know when it's not. And that's a-okay to just use Zoom or anything else. The other thing too that I have noticed and they're not perfect yet, once again, at least at the time of this recording, is that always thinking about it for accessibility purposes, they're good, but I still feel like that it can be better. And I know that's a challenge for them. I've actually given this feedback to a, a few of these people just saying like, I really want there to be more inside of this. What can you do? And they're like, yep, we're well aware, we're working on things, but it does seem to be a challenge for these various types of crazy um, advances of how we're doing things. So definitely check for that as well too, for your organization, your own personal requirements, everything else, want to make sure to mention that. The other thing that I started to do inside of courses, which is interesting, is that I created things that are called workshop 
watch parties because we would always have these forms of webinars like this. This is currently being recording. People can then go and watch this later on at their own time. That's fantastic. What was going to help people to bond more over the fact that they all watch the same type of recording is that you can put it inside of a course and then put a conversation below that to then be able to ask people about what they thought. So you can ask about what were your main takeaways? This is actually coming from a uh, workshop about backward design. And after this, we literally asked the students to comment down below and say, what did you learn? What was your favorite part? What was interesting to you the most? Anything else of a sort like that? That always leads to more conversations afterwards because they feel like they're watching it together. Kind of like they're watching a movie. They're watching this thing together and then they can go in the comment and share, learn more about whatever it was that we talked about. And if I'm going to be doing that, I have seen statistically as far as for if I just say, here's your recorded webinar and I send it to people as far as for an announcement or via email, that does not get watched as much as opposed to me embedding it inside of a course and then framing it like a workshop watch party in this way. It is more effective. Couldn't tell you why besides the other reasons I just mentioned, but by far, that is a way to drive up more engagement if you are finding that same type of issue. Another thing are checklists. Tried, true, simple. People want to be able to have downloadable takeaways and checklists for what it was that they're going through. Uh, this course we are currently seeing on here was talking about collaborating with subject matter experts. I essentially teach a course about human skills and how to work with other people is essentially the gist of it. As an instructional designer, it can be a challenging thing to work with so many subject matter experts, different personalities, different wants and different needs and, and things of that nature. The students after taking for the first cohort asked if I can give them a checklist so that that way they could take something, they can put it on their wall as they're either emailing the subject matter expert or if they're going into a meeting with them for face-to-face -face or Zoom, and they could bring the checklist with them to know about what items to be able to touch upon and when. Very simple idea, extremely effective to be able to give to people because they're not always going to have access to their laptops, to their classrooms, or anything else. And I started to do that too with all my courses at MIT as far as for making a checklist about the main takeaways for the end of every week. Essentially a summary of notes, if you will, because I grew up taking notes when I went and I would take any course, I would always take notes. For a lot of folks online, they don't do that. They just go through screen by screen by screen. And if you give them the template to be able to follow, to have them take their own notes and to be able to see some of these bulleted pointed items, they are far more likely to actually use it. So hence, if we give it to them, reduce another barrier, and that is going to be going up as well. And I just want to make sure that I am looking at everything. Cool. Uh, as far as for the chat, this next thing though, I'm being sure to monitor the time as well, is a technique that I use that's called course mapping. Give me to the chat for me real quick. How many of you have done course mapping before? Give me a yes or give me a no. I am shocked to already see four yeses. Many yeses, yes. That is fantastic to see. This was something I was trained on when I first became a designer early on. And it kind of blows my mind about how many people still don't use course mapping to this day. And I'm, you know, I don't know why, because we want to be able to see the entire learner journey from start to finish and to make sure that everything that we are designing from a sense of the outcomes to the topics, the objectives and everything else really does make sense. And especially too, when we're thinking about revising courses and going back through with the prototypes and the feedbacks of being able to pinpoint exactly where we could improve a upon certain type of course. Because to me, I essentially use this as really Lego blocks, putting everything all together. And as you can tell, when thinking about my own learning experiences, thinking about it from a sequential standpoint is different. A lot of people don't think about a course like that, especially if they're using a learning platform where essentially it is not as easy to be able to take and change things. There's many learning platforms out there, but essentially say, here is your reading section, here is the video folder, and then the assignment at the end. But the thing is, what if you don't want the assignment way at the end? 
What if you want to embed multiple assignments? And it makes sense to do that after so many readings or a video or something along those lines. And that's how I think about my learning experiences and using course mapping. So in this case, having something like readings, videos, poll question, videos, practice, assessment item, discussion, reflection in that order was the right path to do for this module of this course. Other times, it might look different depending upon the topic and depending upon what is it that we're trying to be able to do, which is always an interesting thing. Well, now, folks, once again, I want to put you into breakout rooms. And from what you just did, building off of those conversations of everything that you have so far already for the learning objective, then you had your assessments that you work on. Now I want you to pick and choose two different types of learning activities that would complement the assessment that you just worked on. What I mean by that, what would make sense for something to go before it, after it, something along those lines. <laughs> so for folks, the last thing I want to be able to go through with you is that we thought about our creativity, our innovation. We put everything kind of all together here, but my next question for you is how do you know if what you're doing is designed well? Because we can do all of these crazy, cool, and awesome and innovative things, but if it falls flat and our students aren't really thinking about this as being that great, then we're wasting time and effort. We need to go back to the drawing board. So here is my question to all of you. Once again, please go into the chat. How many of you do pilot programs, prototypes? Give me a yes or give me a no. I am already shocked to see yeses. This is always when I get the no's. <laughs> so now I'm seeing more no's. Uh, Mid-semester check. Yep. Yep. A exactly. Piloting your own program. Yep. As well, too. You're in three pilots right now. My goodness. Yes. They will tell you pre-post. Yes. So there's different ways of doing forms of pilot programs. Many of you just mentioned your own ways about how you go about with doing these things. Before I explain about how I go about with doing the pilot programs at MIT and with uh, Miami and, and everywhere else that I teach, this is what I want you to be able to think about because this took me a while to actually grasp. And that's the mindset around feedback. As educators, we have been trained to ask for feedback. But then when you get the feedback, that doesn't necessarily resonate with you when you're like, oh, I didn't realize that that's how they perceived what they just went through. Honestly, it can be hurtful and you can be like, oh, that's not that great. However, I have found over the years that they never were coming from a stance of trying to be able to, to hurt, but much more to be able to help. And that is their way to be able to deliver the feedback. And one of the things that I had to acknowledge was that I am not my target audience. So from an educational perspective, an andragogy perspective, everything is designed correctly, appropriately. It should be fantastic. But the students are coming in with their different prior levels of knowledge, different experiences. They do not perceive everything the way that I hope is going to be perceived because they're people and they have their own different types of backgrounds and everything of a sort. That has to be taken into consideration to recognize their experiences. And then if, of course, possible, bringing those into the student experience, bringing that student voice into everything that really is one of the basic and the core fundamentals of andragogy and knowing about how adults learn, the more we can add in their voice into the design, the better it's going to be. And to give you one example about how I just failed completely miserably on something and I just totally missed a mark with things is that I was going through and reviewing the survey data from my students, and I heard from them about how long it was taking them to do the learning activities. And one of the learning activities that we had way too much of, in my opinion, in these uh, courses were multiple choice questions. There were so many. There was so many at the end of every single module. And I'm like, all right, this doesn't make sense. So it's like, all right, that's taking them a ton of time. What if I just remove those and instead we would just carry on and not have multiple choice questions. I reached out to my fellow colleagues, my other instructors, my other instructional designers. Everyone's just like, absolutely, get rid of them. It's fine. I was like, all right, pfft, they're gone. And then immediately I removed them. The next day, my inbox exploded with students saying, Luke, where are the multiple choice questions? What did you do? And I'm like, ah, you were taking too much time. I thought I was going to save you time. And then all of a sudden, this flurry of people be like, no, 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 no. I love those. They helped me to check my understanding. It was super important. I was like, okay. 
I messed up that and was like, okay, I'm putting them back in the course. So everyone is going to be okay. And I'll find a better way to be able to identify the area of why are you taking so long to being able to do the learning activities. So hence, this is why it's so important, not just to incorporate what we know from other fellow people that we respect and within our field, but also hearing from students too, to be able to make the best kinds of designs. Now I follow a model that is a long and type of a fancy terminology, which is called an explanatory sequential mixed methods approach. And what this really does boil it down to is that I put a survey at the end of every single week inside of my courses, and then I follow up this survey data and information with doing a qualitative phase with being able to do focus groups and interview people to be able to ask more thought provoking questions around data that I do not understand. And then therefore, I draw my overall interpretation and then apply that into the next run of the course. This is what this actually looks like is essentially it's a survey with a Likert scale one to five with, as you can probably guess, with one being not so great with five being outstanding. But what I want to be able to know about and why I do this in this way is that I'm going to know about the relevancy of everything that they just went through. Is it relevant for them, for their academic journeys, their jobs, their goals? Is it timely? Is this something that they are currently encountering right now? Do they find it immediately helpful with where they are at inside of their learning process? And of course, was it engaging? Was it meaningful? Did it actually make you be thrilled and enjoyed to actually go and to do this? So this is what is interesting about this. And I know that a lot of people um, don't do this type of approach is that they don't do weekly surveys. They usually ask this at the end of the course evaluation as far as we're at the end of the eight weeks, the 16 weeks things of that nature. In my opinion, that's too long. It is far too long because you want that real time feedback because if they're going to be filling this out at the end of the eighth week and they wanted to be able to tell you about a video in week two that they watched that didn't resonate with them, you're not gonna know. You're not gonna have that opportunity unless if that student proactively reaches out to you. And other than that, plenty of people don't do that. So because of that, you have no way of knowing about this information. Therefore tells you in real time about what to fix, especially if something is an enormous problem that you find out at the end of week one that you need to fix immediately before week two begins, you can do that with this kind of technique. Yes, it by all means, it's time consuming. It's difficult to be able to do at first, but once you get into this routine and this pattern, it can be extremely helpful for everything for going forwards. The other thing that I include inside of these surveys is that I want to know how long does it take them? Because if I say it's going to take you three to five hours to do a week, and then I hear from people, which I did from that multiple choice question example, that it was taking them 20 hours. It's like, what are you doing? Where? Where is this time being spent that is taking you 20 hours to do a three hour thing? I don't understand. Like I need to know more. I also include a tell me anything section, which usually in a quantitative researcher's perspective is a humongous no, no. And you never do that because then you get flooded with all these things that are difficult to be able to put inside of your data, but super helpful to be able to do. And of course, making sure that there is a type of a follow-up interview section inside of there to know who to interview at the end of everything. You can do this with whatever you use for Qualtrics or Google Forms or whatever is your appropriate method to be able to do so. I would highly recommend to do this if you can. Once you have this information and this data, scrub the data. Look for themes and patterns and things that you can't explain about. That is always my biggest thing. So to give you that example, when hearing about from some students that like, it should take you five hours and I would hear from them that it took them 20 hours where I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I have no idea where you're spending this time. What I actually found out was from the reflection questions that I mentioned to you not that long ago, I had reflection questions at the end of every single week. What I found is that I did not give them a prompt as far as for a maximum word count. So 
I was not looking at their submissions entirely. And then I realized that some of them were writing like 20 page full blown papers, APA style. And I was like, oh gosh, no, 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 no. I want to like three to four sentences maximum, but I didn't actually specify that. So because of that, I learned very quickly that I needed to have a word count, a limit or a general sample for them to be able to go and to follow. Then from there, I like to be able to make a script of essentially eight to 10 interview questions. And for these questions, you can get extremely granular in nature to be able to say something like 75% of you said week four was awesome. Why? What did you love about week four that you didn't like inside of week three? Like help me figure this out so that that way I can make that better and incorporate more of these learning strategies for the next time around the next and the next. And typically how it goes for the focus groups and the interviews, the maximum I want to do is like three to four people really, because I want there to be a dialogue and a conversation. I tried to do more. And usually it's just one or two main voices dominate the entire conversation. And then that's kind of it. It's also interesting that I found out that the more that I do these types of smaller groups, when one person starts to chime in and answer, this makes other people then jog their memory and say, oh yeah, I remember week four. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the, did the and it kind of like went on from there. So that type of multiple people interview possible is uh, is absolutely something you should be doing. Of course, if you can record it, if, if all allowed and everything else, got to make sure to follow those guidelines and whatnot, depending upon your institution, the target audience, the blah, blah, blah. Make sure you obviously do that and be safe. If recording is allowed, super duper. You can also be able to tackle this as far as sort of like a two-person team. So usually I am the one, I got the microphone. I'm usually the one asking people questions. And then one of my colleagues will be the note taker. And then that way they can listen in and see if there's anything that I missed or I should be answering, uh, asking more follow-up questions about or anything like that. And then that way we have a much more of a better sense of a complete picture. Now, once you have all of that stuff, that's when you get to actually analyze, analyze the results and then prioritize about what you should be tackling and doing next. Usually the categories around these are around behavioral patterns, about the relatability of the content, about their different forms of preferences, about how they prefer to learn. We, we talked about a lot of different types of activities and assessments, so wanting to know more about that. The timing, even the difficulty of things. Sometimes this can be really challenging too. I know that for teaching my doctoral students, it was interesting trying to find what is the right level of difficulty your doctoral students this has to be a challenge but also at the same time I don't want to crush you so I got to make sure to find that right balance so being sure to ask about those difficulty levels has been extremely helpful and of course if there's anything else that I can incorporate as far as for an additional resource we talked about podcasts checklists things like that if I can take any of those ideas or any things that I can just pick up on where you're saying you're not asking for a podcast podcast, but what you're telling me is that you have time and a commute. Therefore, the podcast is a solution. A few different things that popped up like that of asking more thought-provoking questions and then trying to be able to figure out what solution I can do from there. Then the next part, which is extremely important as far as for you doing this with your classroom, your design, is to set realistic goals. Because everybody is just like, okay, I've now identified these areas of improvement, of opportunity. I'm going to go do everything. And it's like, well, can you? Do you have the time, the bandwidth? Are you in the right mental headspace? Can you actually do all of these things? If you can, fantastic. If you realize that one is a super priority and you got to do it first and the other two are kind of like nice to haves and you can do that later, then that's what it is. So be sure to tackle those and rank those in a type of realistic goal setting and expectations that you can actually do. For tools, you can do whatever works for you. Uh, it really doesn't matter. If you want to use the technology to be able to do so, Jira, Trello boards, Monday.com, anything like that, that's fine. Of course, you can use Google, Whiteboard, Sticky Notes, Excel, whatever works for you, as long as it fits for your needs, your organization, your stakeholders, if you're working with multiple people, whatever works for you is absolutely A-OK -okay as far as for this goes. And if you are able to do this and to keep on changing things in real time and then collecting more feedback from the next run and the next and the next, eventually you're going to have this wealth of data of information of being able to say that like, we got it right. We figured it out. This clearly is what works. And therefore you can take those lessons and then apply them into your other areas, into your other classes, share it with your colleagues. And it's only going to help out your organization more as time goes on. 
So folks, I am finally going to stop talking with these last few things. The reflection, as I talked about reflections, reflection for you at the end of this webinar, I would love for you to think about your most significant takeaways from everything that we just went through over these last two hours. And of course, how can you adapt everything from these teachings and from these findings into your own online designs and your own classroom? And the last thing I want to say is obviously a big thank you for being here with us for such a long period of time, even though it felt super duper short like that. If you like my style of how I go about with nerding out and this type of podcast setup, if you will, I wrote a book, as Yorick mentioned, what I wish you knew before becoming an instructional designer. There's an audible version. So if you literally want to listen to me talk about instructional design and online learning for five hours, you can. So there's an audible version of the book, of course, a physical and an ebook. I am everywhere online. If you Google Dr. Luke Hobson, the YouTube, the blog, the podcast, the everything will pop up for there. And then last but not least, I run an instructional design boot camp to train instructional designers specifically within the higher education field. So if you want to know more about andragogy, UDL, backward design, evaluating experiences, building a portfolio, anything of that nature, I teach all of those things inside of Instructional Design Institute. And the next course is starting on May 1st which is not that far away. So May 1st is the next one. But folks, that is all I have for you. The last couple minutes, any questions, I'd love to answer them for you for whatever you may have. But once again, just thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Luke. I'm going to uh, stop the recording.